Okay, so let me see if I can do the last ones of these here. Um, so what did we cover? I think the last thing we covered was crazy making and gaslighting. We should talk a little bit about gang stalking. I think I, t I touched on it a little bit. Um, gang stalking is really when, uh, you know, a person is, um, for whatever reason, whether it's for experimentation purposes or, or whatever, um, or if it's because the person's been identified as a threat to um, this group, whatever this group is, um, or this hive-minded kind of group, then uh, what will happen is it will be arranged that, that um, you'll have gang stalking. And gang stalking can be used through the bots. It can also be more personal. They can have people move in next to you. Um, they may uh, track your phone. They might um, go visit your websites. Uh, they may talk to people that you know. Um, but it usually is like a group of people. I've seen uh, there's this one... Um, gang of group stalking people where they that, that are really operating online and I've seen them do it time and again um gang stalking usually it's a big chunk of that is character assassination well usually a lot of the time their goal is to make you be in fear be in a fear state fear for your life fear for your family um usually it's still has plausible deniability uh, the goal is to put you into crazy making make you look crazy make you kind of flip out because you see it but the rest of the world can't see it um they may um put people out front of your house you'll see the same people in over and over again um again they may be listening in on your conversations uh they'll have people um interact with you online or in person um, the gang, the gang stalking can be so incredible. Um, it's, it's so incredible that it's unbelievable in most, what we call TI victims, um, targeted individuals. Um, <clears throat> if it wasn't for a couple of doctors that have stepped forward now and said, yes, this is the real deal, <clears throat> um, where they started finding ways to document it and, um, you know, whether it's video or footage or whatever, um, they have been documenting now that there are cases of targeted individuals. Uh, what it is that qualifies you to become a targeted individual um is probably open for a pretty broad spectrum so if you're an outspoken person or you're a person that um might be getting ready to release something that could be dangerous whether it's information or technologically or um you know maybe you're a person that may be forming connections or you might be building a social group or you could you know Anybody that would be deemed a threat to the hive mind, and we talked a little bit about that, where there's a swarming effect that happens, um, that's so, it's so, until you are the on the receiving end of it, much like uh, being a narcissist victim, because you're the target, no one else sees it, uh, it's, it falls into this weird area where it, it seems unbelievable because nobody believes that anybody would, you know, go to that lane to drive somebody crazy but that is happening it's it's very much happening and now it's being documented by doctors so it really is a real thing <clears throat> um and a lot of times it's happening more on a happening more on the line of hang on it's happening more along the lines of online so they have bots now that do it so if um and you may have, like, they've had channels that were taken down and stuff like that. And those are people that are more free thinking or they're outspoken or they're saying something that doesn't work for what they're trying to uh, convince people of. Or people that are just straight calling them out, you know. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there's obviously the silencing that goes in along with that. So it could be silencing or it could be um, super high level uh, levels of gang stalking. Like I said, they could pay to have somebody move into your house spying on you, listening in on your conversations, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, you can look up targeted individuals. I don't want to get into all the details of it here because it is so complicated. Um, but yeah, people should look into that. Uh, gang stalking is, is quite real and it's, it's, um, who's doing that. It's, it's, it could be a variety of, of groups, but they, they do have the same type of mentality. Triangulation, pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> they will, manage to get two people into a situation where they're kind of pitted against one another or they'll pit you against another person minions plays into this a lot because what you have is um those people have no idea <clears throat> what this person's like and you're on the receiving end <clears throat> sorry my frog in my throat haha -ha. um 
you'll have, you know, you'll have a totally different view of who these people are because they do wear different masks. So you'd be um, a victim of them, but everybody else thinks they're normal. Uh, typically what you'll have um, with political sphere, you'll have um, a person that's trying to speak up and say something's up and uh, then they'll whip their, you know, their, the people that are, um, that see this other side of them that they've wanted them to see into a frenzy using the um, hope cultivation and empathy cultivation and then they'll demonize this person or individual. And that's the triangulation. Uh, you know, they may put one individual against each another. Um, you know, what would be a good example of that? Um, so politics, political sphere. So you could use like a Stormy Daniels example. So it's like, okay, well, we don't like this person. So we also don't like the way the narrative's going. So we'll, we'll bring it, you know, we'll have, we'll focus on this issue. Forget whether the issue is real or not. Just take that out of the equation. I'm just trying to give you an example of how now we have another party in the mix. Um, that now changes the whole conversation um, into a narrative that, um, you know, is different. And there's another person. Now we have another person in the mix, right? So triangulation is really about, it really, a lot of times it's used for character assassination. It's really, it can be used to help control a narrative. It can be used to um, convince people of something, uh, it's just a very manipulative way of going. Um, it can also be used to trigger people. So, uh, for example, if they they find somebody that fits a conversation that they want, they might um, pick somebody out of a crowd. So let's say let's say they're paying a huge gang of people to run drugs, but they'll find one guy. Um, and they'll put him on the pedestal and they'll give him all this airtime of saying how hard it is. And, and really what they want is for you to um, feel bad. And so they've used that person or party to triangulate you into changing your mind or seeing it their way. Or to um, trigger you to emotionally react to make them their puppet. Triangulation is, is often about, you know, weaponizing a third party uh, to get you to make a different decision or make a choice or make, um, or change your mind about something or to, um, get you to act a certain way. And it's really not about that other person. And in fact, you could probably go through the list of all the people that like came out of nowhere that were suddenly on every channel. And you're like, where did this person come out, uh, out from under a rock? Um, and suddenly they're the biggest thing you're hearing about on the news, for example. Um, and they're being used or weaponized against whoever the target person is. So if somebody says, you know, I'm for, I don't know what, um, I'm for homeschooling, you know, and then they'll find, a, you know, a group, an organization or individual that like will tell you every thousand ways from Sunday of how that's terrible or how bad that was or you know, so, so they would like to triangulate groups against groups. Um, so, you know, you get the blacks against the police, the females against the men, the straight people versus the gay people and the gay people versus, the, you know, and the, I mean, so it just doesn't matter. Like, like I said, you take all the emotional content out of it and then you can see it more clearly of how this is uh, quite masterfully done. So the triangulation more in the big scheme of things. It can go everything, everything from the individual against the individual to groups versus groups. But really it's about using one thing um, to manipulate another. <clears throat> where they aren't, where they can sit in the middle and play the plausible deniability card. This didn't, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me, right? If you're the host of a show and you pit, um, you know, if you bring in a, a white supremacist and a, and a, a um, you know, someone from a, a black leader group and you put them in the same room and they end up getting in a brawl, you knew really, you knew quite well what you were walking into with that, right? You wanted to incite rage or you wanted to incite um, both groups to, to anger. And so by having the one pitted against the other and they hear you, but you're in the center, right? So they're in the middle, and they get to play a plausible deniability card. Well, you know, uh, I didn't see that coming. 
<laughs> now we got run streets. <laughs> it's, I mean, or it's in a, it's in a debate now because this became a big thing. Um, so really it's just, you got to kind of look at it's their way of sitting on the sidelines and not getting, being held accountable for anything while they're pitting people against each other in a relationship, you know, what to have is like, um, let's see, let's say you're, you're a girl interested in a guy, but he's, you know, talking to his, his friend who's a girl and he keeps using her to get into your head. Um, to, to make you crazy. Um, and you know, she may have no idea what he's doing. She, she might just be somebody that like talks to him and, and let's say he only talks to her when you're there. And for the most part, he doesn't give her the time of day. And otherwise, you know, there, there's nothing really going on necessarily, but they're just using that person. It's convenient. It's convenient. Um, so another one is isolation. We talked about that too. Isolating others, um, how they're doing it. They've done it by breaking, um, you know, they've done it through, gosh, even in the way they've set up um, city housing. I mean, in part, you know, they've uh, kept certain groups poor. They've kept other groups, um, you know, everything from toxins to shots to um you know, the way that they've structured it, it's, this one's complicated. I mean, the way they've, they can isolate everything from where you're living to where you are, what you're seeing online. And the reason is, is because, um, cause I've covered this so much. I feel like I'm just kind of being redundant right now with this one. Um, in the point, point of isolating you is to, um, make you feel alone and take your power away. Bottom line. Um, best example, um, best example is, uh, let's say people have a following on YouTube and, uh, they're being followed and they have a hundred thousand viewers and YouTube decides that this isn't a narrative they want. So then they drop them down to 2000, you know, from like a hundred thousand to 2000. Now this person's like, what just happened? I've had catastrophic losses of people that aren't following me anymore. And you don't know those people might actually be following, or maybe they've been through an algorithm unfollowed on, you know, without their knowledge, right? So now they just stop showing up. Well, we talked about that before, but here's the thing. Um, those people now feel like nobody, they don't have a voice anymore than they can't, you know, they can't reach out. Um, and they feel like, you know, so every time they're doing a video, they don't know how many people are actually hearing them. They have no idea. And what the reason for that, the reason they do that, and the reason the narcissist in a relationship does that is because they want you to feel alone. They want you to feel like you don't have any power. They want you to feel, and when it's quite the contrary, actually, um, they don't want you to assert yourself. They need you to feel alone and isolated, and they want you to be in a um, an echo chamber because they want you to feel like you don't have any control over your life or, or have any say in doing that. You give your power away in a lot of ways. Um, but you feel like you don't know, you can't create groups. You can't reach out. You can't make friends. You can't build a, um, a movement. You can't get your message out. Um, they may shadow ban you. No one will see your, no one will see your, um, your messages. Um, it's really to, to diminish your ability to, um, to be heard, to stick up for yourself in a relationship. They isolate you because they don't want anyone helping you. They don't want you getting out. So what they'll do, um, is you, you want to go somewhere and they don't say you can't, although in this particular frame, in this particular instance, they straight up have come out and said you can't, uh, but in a relationship, often the time they don't want the plausible deniability, um, they don't have any of lawsuits. So they basically will say, um, you know, if you do go to do something, then they'll shame you. They'll guilt you. Um, they'll do projection. Are you cheating on me? Are you, you know, where were you? Why didn't you call? Or they'll love, or they'll text you incessantly to make it so miserable on you or they'll follow you or stalk you. Um, you know, or if you go try to go out with other people, they'll pick fights with those people so that those people don't want to be your friends anymore. Um, they'll say horrible things. They'll try and turn you against your family, against your friends, or they'll try and turn your friends and family against you. Um, they'll create through the triangulation efforts 
um, efforts to turn people against you. Eventually, the goal is to completely isolate you so that they have total control over you. Um, that way, they can abuse you in private. And, um, and out on the outside, everybody thinks they're awesome and you're, and they've made you so crazy that they think you're the crazy one and they're the, the nice one. And then they'll tell everybody that they're the victim when in fact you're the victim. But they can't, they can't tell everybody that, that they're the victim, um, if people are witnessing what's going on. And that's kind of the mistake that they've made with uh, trying to isolate people on the social media networks and people that are screaming about it saying, this is crap. Um, it's becoming pretty clear to, to people that are at least on the receiving end. But those groups, you know, they're screaming loudly um, that, uh, that this is happening. But if you talk to anybody else that, that has no clue that's, that's still um, drinking all the Kool-Aid, those people have no idea um, what's actually even going on. They have no idea. Like, did you know that there's this huge movement to, like, get rid of, you know, the Second Amendment, to shut people down, to to turn off their channels, that people are being shadow banned, that people... And those people have no idea what's going on because they're in, they've been really well insulated in their isolation uh, inside of these um, algorithmic social media bubbles um, where they're in an echo chamber. So for them, it's business as usual. They have no idea. It'd be like if you were in a bubble city and everybody outside the city was like dying and sick and, and horrible things were happening, but you were in bubble city and they made everything seem really, really perfect. Like everything's super great. Don't even worry about it. Like life is wonderful. Life is awesome. Just keep listening to me talk. Even though they're struggling and they're, they're exhausted and they're working to let's say 20 hours a day and you know, but they're being told they're not victims. So they're just, they're like, okay, I don't know why I'm so tired. I don't know why I've, you know, why I can't afford bread this week. And I, they have no, and they're unhappy, but they don't know why. And they're being told what to think. Um, here's why you're not happy. So they're being told why they're not happy. Every, every, everything that has them frustrated and miserable, they're being told it's something else. Um, and they're like, okay, well, it must be that because everybody's saying it and nobody's saying anything different. <laughs> but on the outside, you know, the, the people that are awake are like, dude, dude, you're a slave. Do you realize you're a slave? <laughs> yeah. So, and that's kind of why the same thing with the narcissists, they isolate their victims because they don't want somebody in the family saying, gosh, you seem really unhappy. You know, maybe you should get out of that relationship you know, hey, meet this super cool guy, I, I, you know, want to introduce you to somebody new, you know, they don't want to have any chance that you'll break free. Um, so they just keep you nestled away from everybody where they can completely and absolutely control that narrative. It works the same way with the relationship, guys. It really does. Um, it's kind of scary. So isolation is really hypercritical for them to contain, contain control. And what you'll see with these people, um, they have all the different groups isolated. So like I said about compartmentalization earlier, it's actually even in the relationship, even at the relationship level, that's how they operate. The family may not know other parts of the family. The kids may have never met the grandparents, the, you know, the girlfriend may never meet, you know, the boss, the boss may not, you know, it's, this is how they, they do things. They, they isolate everybody. And if, and if you have the audacity to say, well, how come I haven't met these people? Then they literally go on the attack, um, to make you feel stupid. Um, or they'll play the shame guilt card or they'll talk you into circular conversations until you stop confronting them with obvious things. Don't confront me with the obvious things, right? Uh, so what they do to get you to, to back down is they go on the attack. So that's when they'll play that rage card. How dare you? Da, 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 da. You know, are people like, why are you getting rid of my free speech? And it's like, you people are horrible monsters. You're, you're saying all these terrible, horrible, terrible things. Ah, oh, racist, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's like, what just happened? <laughs> we were talking about Twinkies over here. We had one statement that didn't fit your narrative. You just turned off my entire channel, which just happened, you know, so it's it, and that's going them going on the attack and then talking rhetoric and then they tell everybody that you're a monster and those people are like wow these people are monsters but they never look beyond they, they may not even go to the next step of actually listening to the the, vi the the video or what was actually said they don't actually look at what was said or done they just listen to what they've been told by somebody they trust because they've been told to trust this person and this person is the only thing they get to hear so of course it must be what's real right Whew. 
are you getting exhausted yet? It's hard for me to even tell you the tactics. It's, it's more exhausting to be on the, to, you know, to, um, <laughs> to be on the receiving end of it, but you know, it's just, as, it's just as exhausting to try to explain it to people because it's so convoluted and confusing. So withdrawal, um, withdrawal, hmm. I think for withdrawal, what we're probably talking about is a slow whittling away of, um, on the social scale withdrawal, you know, in a relationship with withdrawal means is that the person, they, they withdraw, whether it's emotionally or they withdraw, um, uh, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with isolation and they're just kind of do this disappearing thing. And, um, but they, they make you feel alone. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the isolation because, and, and, uh, because I guess with withdrawal, it's more like they've withdrawn from you. Um, in some ways what's happened here is that they, what they've done with withdrawal in the social setting, um, it's more about families withdrawing from families groups withdrawing from groups, um, that cohesiveness, that openness, that healthy diversity of, of thought and healthy diversity of groups and cultures, while they don't have to see eye to eye, they do live side by side. Um, but it's created this huge conflict where people are literally withdrawing. You have families, it's become so toxic now, um, that while they're not doing the withdrawal themselves, we're in a narcissistic relationship. It would be the narcissist that's doing the withdrawing. Instead, they're creating withdrawal in your life, um, whether it's socially, financially. Uh, maybe you can't afford to do the things you used to want to be able to do. You can't get out as much. You don't have as much time. Um, it's harder. It's too It's too expensive. You can't even get on a plane. You can't, it's harder to fly to where you want to go. Now it's scary to fly where you want to go, so you don't even, you know, it's like created all this terrorist crap, so now... You don't want to get on a plane because who knows, or, you know, TSA is going to fill you up if you get all the, you know, to go see the family over and, you know, maybe you'll just skip it this year. Um, and you don't see eye to eye on the politics or you don't see eye to eye on some of these topics and you're scared it'll come up. And so it's better to just avoid it. So which you, they've created this whole dynamic now, um, on almost every topic you could possibly think of. If you really look back on it, if you were to just go back on it and say, what was the top, what were the topics this year, that year, and the next year, um, a look at how divisive it, it, it's been didn't matter what party it's been the same thing so um in looking at that it's it's very divisive and so with the withdrawal that's occurred is really um it's almost like society is, is uh separating at the seams every aspect of it and they like that because um it kind of goes with isolation and people feel like they're alone um, withdrawal is really about feeling alone. Um, you don't feel emotionally supported in a large way. Um, and it makes you wonder what you did wrong in a lot of ways. So people are spending a lot of time, um, you know, there's super incredible numbers of anxiety and depression. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's technological, uh, some of it's chemical, um, but a, and a good chunk of it too is just what situationally what's been going on and what we're hearing, what we're being told and what we're told to believe and the things don't make sense. And it's exhausting. Um, it's extremely exhausting trying to make sense of eventually you're just like, I just give up. The world can't be improved. And they want you to think that the world can't be improved. And part of the reason it can't be improved is because they've managed to isolate everybody um, and their strength in numbers. Right. So withdrawal is, is really um, it's really about making the person feel alone and unsupported. Game theory. Um, I kind of want to save this one for last. I'm going to come back to that one because it's last. Excessive texts and excessive calling. Uh, so that's on there because at the relationship level, this is a thing. But then if you look at the stroke page text, <laughs> ah, I left it. I had to bring it up because, well, you know, um, these people have a level of anxiety that's kind of awesome. It's one of the best, their best weaknesses from the perspective of how to combat them. Because when you're calm and everything's chillax, um, 
if you can remain in control and they can't trigger you and you have no fear of them, then your best weapon against them is their own anxiety. And you're seeing that now because that's what um, this this military group that's been working to try and take things back. And I do think that something's going on within the government where there's groups that are starting to wake up and figure out what's going on. And they are there is a groups of people that have been trying to work. Um, and there's people that are starting to wake up to it. And this has nothing to do with politics. You have a sick, you have a sick um, group of people that are embedded all throughout the world. And they do what they want to do. And I don't know how long this has been going on for, uh, but people are starting to catch on to these these tactics, and they're not liking it, and they want the world to do uh, to do better, and uh, and heal, and have access to new technology, and be able to have a world that would be really cool to live in. Um, but what's cool about the reason I left in the excessive text and calling is because part of the reason they do excessive text and call it's because they have a super high, crazy level of anxiety and they need attention and affection. A lot of it. Um, you may even get robocalls during political campaigns, right? Um, so they really do use the tech a lot, um, but it's really just about, it's that level of anxiety about them. It's actually one of their weaknesses uh, because they are so afraid all the time but they won't, they'll make you think that they're fearless and awesome. But there is a level of fear to lose control. And so um, in a relationship, part of the reason for the excessive texts and calls is because their um, their need to control everything. And so they'll bomb you, bomb you. And, they'll, and, and that's part of the love bombing phase. Like when you first get, get to know them, especially with politicians, it's like, I'm better than everyone else. And here's why I'm awesome. And I love you guys. And I care about you guys. And it's, you know, they're going to tell you everything you want to hear. And they've researched you. And then they're like, you know, sign up for our text and we'll tell you every week what we're doing. And, you know, so that's on the political scheme. That's the thing, right? They don't call so much, but it's it's mostly now they're using text messaging and email to tell you how awesome they are and how awesome you are and how important you are and give money. <laughs> right? But they don't really need money because, you know, they're connected to all the people that print money. So what do they need it for? Um, but, you know, that falls right back into their draining your resources. Why? Because even if they don't need money and even if they have access to incredible numbers of resources from some of the more um, empowered people in the world that really enjoy oppressing and and hurting and harming everyone, um, even though they don't even necessarily need the money, they'll take more because it's one less dollar for you to do something with. um, And so it just oppresses you further. So why do people that have all the money need more money? Because it means you don't have it. And that just makes your life more uncomfortable. And plus, they really get off on the fact that you giving them money makes you think that you have some kind of power over. <laughs> it's an entertainment thought for them. It's like, oh, then, you know, they're giving me money because they, they think that I'm going to do, do what they want with, you know, it, that somehow them contributing to my campaign is going to make me more apt to do what they want me to do. Ha ha ha. You know, they really do get off on these power trips. It's really fun for them. Okay. Ever presence. This one's straight out of HD tutor. Ever presence is, um, it's hard to understand it. (laughs) You know, it's on a relationship level. It's kind of odd. It's like they have this way of, leaving little things in places or like, oh, and my ex's favorite is like uh, colognes and sprays. Um, they come through and like, smell this perfume, <laughs> you know, leave a huge, or, or leave it or, you know, and it's hard for me to say, I don't know how intentional it is, but it, it's something that they just do um, where these little remnants or reminders of, of the, about them all over the place. Um, they'll have a tendency to do stuff or they'll do things that they know drive you crazy, but that, you'll remember that they were there and it's just kind of to stay it's almost a little it's like having their own way of haunting you (laughs) um you know and you know if some of the people I know it's like it's hard to say how intentional it is or if it's just a byproduct of their nature and you know at the level of like some of the more elite ones I'd say that it's pretty um it's pretty intentional so for them, it's more like you could just this is this would be pretty easy. So advertisements um, through the calls and texts. That's a, that's a way of having ever presence. Actually, that's another aspect of it. 
Um, it's not just the anxiety component, but it's also their way of trying to stay in control. And it's their way of making sure that you're always thinking about them because then it keeps that energy coming into them. Keep thinking about me. Keep thinking about me. And they're all guilty of doing it. All the politicians. Um, they all do it. That I've seen. You used to use robocalls. They'll use tax and email. Um, but it's just to keep that energy flowing into them, you know, and to keep you, uh, and it's also to kind of keep a pulse on, to make sure that you keep thinking what they want you to think, right? So news outlets, obviously, is another one, radio, um, they control pretty much all the different aspects of the information that you're going to get. And you can boil down who owns that into like six people. And then above that, I think is like one entity. It's kind of crazy. Um, promised gains. Boy, that one's an easy one, right? Does anybody even need to have me explain that one? Promised gains, like that's your number one political theater right there. Here's all the things we're going to do, but we're never going to do it. <laughs> never an easier one to convince people of, right? I don't think I even need to go into that. The reason for promised gains um, is because they... They want to be able to continue to tell you, um, here's what we're going to do. And then they let you down. And, and that is fuel in itself. So here's the part that people probably wouldn't ex expect to hear. They enjoy your pain. They eat your pain. Okay. Um, so making you all these promises, they know full well they're not going to do it. And if they do do it, it's going to be just to be able to sell you on the fact that they did something they said they were going to do at the end. To get you to buy off on all the other 40 things that they're not going to do that they told you they're going to do. They get off on it. They enjoy watching you suffer. They truly do. Um, and they can play on your heartstrings all day long. And if you stop buying um, what one guy's selling you, they'll switch that guy out with another guy that will do the exact same thing. Right? So plausible deniability, um, it's also to uh, crazy make you. Uh, and it's also to make you lose hope. Um, because they want you to feel powerless to change your own life, that you're giving your power away to somebody that's telling you they're going to fix it for you instead of you trying to take steps to act in your life and make the changes yourself. So you're giving your power away to somebody that has no intention of actually doing anything at all to help you out. And because you're not researching carefully enough, you're not finding people that actually do what they say they're going to do. So you can't even vote the people in that would actually do what they say they're going to do to actually make the difference. Because you don't look beyond the idea that what they're saying to you isn't, isn't what their actions are conveying. So really, action is everything with these people. And that's kind of the easiest way. I mean, it's, it's, it's the easiest way without spending a year trying to analyze this entire list of behaviors and observe them for a while. It's kind of like, what's this person's pattern in life? You know, Have they, is this a person that does what they say they're going to do and they, you know, follow through? You know, what's their what's, what's their background like? Um, so promised gains. Yeah, that's the carrot on the string that keeps everybody going and going and going. And, yeah, all the way to the... The chopping block. Constant lying. So, I would be remiss if I said, well, maybe half the time they're lying to you. It's more like 95% of the time. They're lying a lot. But here's the the reason I can't say it's all the time um, is because they have to have just enough uh, for plausible deniability. They have to give you enough truth. And in fact, they enjoy throwing the truth at you um, but then they make it sound like it's crazy. And they're really good at doing that using uh, comedy and comedians and stuff like that. So they'll tell you the truth or they'll use movies and they'll um, make it a big theatrical thing. And they're actually telling you the stuff they're doing and they get off on that. Because, oh, well, I told you what the truth is, um, you know, here, here and here. Uh, but then over here, I'm like, oh, that could never happen, you know. So um, constant lying is pretty much when they open their mouths, they're lying. Everybody says that about politicians anyway. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's the kind of lying where everything they're doing, they're blaming it on other people. Um, they'll, they'll, even the, even if you see it straight with your own eyes, they'll tell you it's something else. It's that level of lying though. It's not like I'm a politician and I'm lying to you. It's like, I'm bold-faced lying to you, and I'm lying to you about something that you know to otherwise to be true. 
and I'm going to continue to lie to you and continue to continue and continue to tell you the biggest lie possible so that it sounds so absurd and crazy that you won't, you, 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 until you believe it. Right. And for people that can see through it, they also get fuel from the people that can see through it and they really enjoy lying especially straight to the face of the people that know otherwise because they get real fuel out of how insane that makes a person. Remember how I said crazy making? Nothing's better at gaslighting somebody when they the person is 100% clear that what the truth is and they bull face say to their straight to their face or on every news outlet possible that this is not to, you know, that this is not what happened. Even when every every ounce of fact says otherwise. Um that nothing will make a person more insane, right? And then they isolate you and they, and they silence you and, and you can't do anything to combat it. And then make sure that you can't prove it to anyone else because you've been, um, because everyone else sees this false image of them. So in the end, you look crazy. If you're, if you've caught on. Hoovering, hoovering. Hoovering is usually at about the, uh, like the midterms or if it's in the, like the, um, at the next election cycle, so if they want presidents, they could do behave horribly for four years and then, um, try and buy you back right before the next election. So that's tends to be when they start actually doing a couple of the promises so they can point at those and say, ignore the other 90% or 95%. Just focus on this 5% here that I did. And that's what they'll, they'll make the entire narrative about the 5% things that they did do. And then you can't get a word in edgewise about all the other things they didn't do or promises that weren't fulfilled or how they how they really voted. Um, there won't be any way for you to actually, uh, there will be nowhere where for you to share that or vocalize that. And you'll be, you'll be basically only telling it in circles about with other people that already know because you've already been isolated into groups and segmented out by algorithms based on the conversation you're having. And if that's not enough, and if you are a real threat again, you could become a targeted individual. So <clears throat> hoovering is really about getting you to love them again. That's what it's about. Um, and, you know, they'll try to buy your love back. And they won't do it for very long. So you can pretty much count on that for a very, a very short period of time before they revert right back to what they were before. And they're incredibly convincing in a lot of cases. And they'll use plausible deniability. So if you have any, any beef with anything they've done, they will always have a sob story or a sad story or a plausible deniability of explanation for it. Or they'll use triangulation and blame it on someone else. Um... Let's see here. Unlawful behavior. These people, um, I'm telling you, they, they, there's really no way to know exactly the levels or extents of their crime. I think the only way would be surveillance <laughs> because they're so very shifty and so very good at w walking in the shadows. Um, the levels of unlawful behavior could be, I mean, the worst of the worst. Um, and you would not even see it coming with these kinds of folks. You wouldn't see it. You just wouldn't. But they do tend to usually have some kind of a problem or an addiction or some kind of um, negative behavior or trait. Um, something typically that's self-destructive. And a lot of the times eventually it comes to light. But it just depends on how, how um, critical they are to the overall value of this hive organization that essentially what you have is... Um, if that every that they may have mass casualties just trying to defend that one person if that person is a mission critical person so and they don't care because they sac they'll sacrifice you know three of their limbs if that one limb is what they need to continue right um but they all have some kind of uh, some kind of deviancy i've yet to have anybody that that has dealt with these people that hasn't that hasn't expressed that this person was Something, you know, smoked pot. I want to say smoked pot. But so many people pissed off at me for that one. Um, did some kind of drug, was some kind of alcoholic, had some kind of a vice, had some kind of an adrenaline rush junkie, um, maybe was a cheater, um, had some kind of risky behavior, like, you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of them are sexually deviant. Um, 
because that not all because you did two different kinds so there's kind of like an intellectual version and then there's the kind of the more somatic where they're um i hope i'm saying this right somatic anyway more physical uh, so those people are more about kernel um reward where the other the more intellectual really is more about like dominance and uh you know, like playing a game of risk kind of dominance versus the people that would like to see sacrifice or, you know, would like to have physical, you know, group sex or something. But usually there's some kind of a sexual deviancy with these people or some kind of sexual harm. They like to um, control or dominate. And in other cases, it's more of like intellectual dominance, how we can screw with people's minds. Um, in both cases, they have kind of like a God complex. Soros is a perfect example of this. Um, in my opinion, you say. Control freak. It, that kind of falls into the God, God, God mode I was telling you about. Uh, you know, and again, control is, is largely to, because of fear. Um, it's, it, you know, for them, they'll be like, I am all powerful. I am, you are nothing. You are a useful appliance. Um, but there is something within them innately that is um, driven at the, at its core by fear. They are disconnected. Um, they can say it's rage control and they'll seem cool and collected. Uh, they don't really have a whole lot of emotional width or breadth, but they are, um, they get a high out of it or at some core level, some, at some level they, they need to be in control. Um, and they do need us in a lot of ways, you know, for our creativity, for the energy that we have, for the, um, we're useful appliances, right? So yeah, they do get, there's control freakuses, you know, but in a lot of ways, if you, if you, if you flip it, the cards over on them and you figure out how they operate, then you're in control and everything they try on you, um, you can use their own weight against them. And once you figure out what their weaknesses are, which is their need to control. So if they can't control you, that sends them through the, through the roof. And if you stay calm and collected, then suddenly they go crazy. And if you stay calm, they look insane. If you stay consistent, they, then other people see that they're not consistent. You know, meme warfare has been a really good way of doing this. If people have been saying like, look at these two things, right? They don't even make sense. And they do it in a picture format. So even the people that have been totally dumbed down, can see how absurd it is when you put it side by side. And part of that's just the act of observing the ridiculousness of it, you know? And they don't like to be humiliated, these people, because they think they're God. So um, anytime you, you flip these tactics around on them, or if you know their tactics and you avoid those tactics, then um, they feel like they're losing control. And then they start to behave and interact. They act erratically and they start to make mistakes a lot of mistakes because one of their biggest downfalls is that anxiety the common cool and collected ones are obviously more dangerous the intellectuals are far more dangerous because um they may not be the most connected necessarily as far as um you know intuitiveness uh but they because they roll in through fear they do have a lot of plans and, and alternative plans to those plans and such and such and so forth and pretty well connected as far as people and minions go. Um, you know, so what they can't account for is the people that can't be puppeteered and know their tactics and are more intellectually intelligent than they are. Uh, those people are extremely dangerous for the intellectual narcissists. If you have somebody that's brilliant, that does know what they're doing and does know the tactics and does know how to counter the tactics and does know how to, you know, creatively, um, outplanned them, outplan them, then you, you have a recipe for, um, success to, to get it to, you know, to correct the problems that we have in the world. But that would take some of the most brilliant minds that have, uh, that care about the world to collect together and, uh, put their heads together and, um, you know, do their own inner work, uh, to become, um, really immune to what's going on, essentially. 
and then the funniest thing of all would be to just watch them be completely um, anxiety ridden beside themselves as they lose their control. Just kind of, I think, what we're starting to see now. And the last one is game theory. And that's where that kind of plays in. So that kind of rolls into this last point, which is game theory, which is, um, it's more like you need to have the best, best hand and the best numbers or don't play. Now, in their case, they have a great hand, but I don't think they have the bigger numbers we do, which is part of why they wanted to reduce the numbers, part of, uh, because it's harder to contain, um, contain people and control narratives and continue, you know, maintain control over a population, uh, the more there is, the more dangerous that becomes because in game theory, you know, you could, if things don't, if people start to step out of it, you, you could lose pretty quick. Um, but yeah, if you don't have it, then you don't play. So in a relationship where you're with a narcissist and let's say they've managed to convince all your friends and family that they're awesome and you suck and they've isolated you and you have no job and, you know, and everything they're trying to do, um, to gaslight you and attack you and get, get to, you know, and get under your skin and make you seem crazy. And, and basically they're sucking, you dry up energy and sucking you dry up all your resources <coughs> or maybe they're, you know, drained your bank account or your savings. Um, the best thing you can do, uh, in game theory, uh, that one of the terms we think one of the tactics was gray rock, which is where you, you give no emotion, you give no response. You just stay completely calm and you just kind of stare and ignore them. Right. So, Oh, let's just take one angry YouTuber completely having a meltdown and screaming and yelling about what's been done to him versus pointing it out calmly and saying, this is just not okay. And then not giving them one more ounce of credibility. Um, the person that's jumping up and down and screaming, yelling is feeding them like crazy energetically, uh, versus the other person that's just firmly saying this is not acceptable. Um, and we're not going to stand for it. I'm going to continue to move forward and I'm going to continue to be unfazed and I'm not going to allow this to bother me, you know, that kind of thing. So there's two different ways of approaching it. One is a more of a gray rock where you're not giving them any energy. Um, and you're, cont you're maintaining that, uh, consistency and you're not allowing them to crazy make you so that you lose credibility. And then in the end, you know, they lose that power over you. Also, uh, the person that does their inner work by default tends to get, if they're doing that spiritual work, if they're facing, um, everything that's being used on them, the minute they start looking at how they've been triggered, what are they using against me? If they stop trying to fix it on the outside and they start fixing it on the inside and using it like a mirror of, okay, how did this person trigger me emotionally? And they go back and they write it down and they start focusing on that and one by one, um, patching up the holes in their armor and they get stronger and stronger, the less and less can be used against them. They're less and less triggerable. They're less and less a puppet, on, uh, emotional puppet on strings because they start cutting the cords to those things and they start healing those things emotionally. Then they become more and more and more immune to being screwed with, to being played, to being emotionally played with, um, like a cat with a mouse, right? Um, you know, they just, they just learn to, um, it just bounces off them. They're, they become a force in themselves. And then as they can, they're able to hold that composure, then they're able to, it literally becomes like people then can see that, um, they can't be, they're not being screwed with anymore. It's very interesting. So it's almost like you stopped playing the game by, Instead of trying to play the game the way they want it to be played, you start playing the game, but you're doing it your own way. Instead of trying to fix it on the outside, you're fixing it on the inside, which then in turn fi fixes it on the outside. <sighs> because of the way quantum works. But anyway, so every time they throw something at you, you take a hard look at yourself and you do that work. And they throw it against you again and it doesn't work. So they try something new and that works on you. So you go back and you look at that and you say, how can I, how can I uh, look at myself honestly and say, is this something that I think like they're throwing this at me? It's triggering me. Why is that? Do I believe in that? Or does somebody that did that also upset me and they figured that out? So I'm going to release that. It doesn't serve me. I don't need to hold on to that. They've shown me through, through showing me where all the holes in my armor are through using those things that I feel deficient in or I feel weak about or I feel uh, um, 
traumatized by, by using those things on me, they thus showed me where I need to go back to the blacksmithy, right? And, and hammer this out. And every time you show up at the door, you're stronger and you're stronger and you're stronger and you're stronger. And eventually you're there, then you are the strong one and they're weak and they start to freak out. They do not know what to do with that. They do not know what to do with that. Um, so that's the profile in a nutshell. Um, I guess the last thing I'd say is this, and this was, uh, I forget who had this example as I've read a lot. I've read so much, um, on narcissism and in, in general on this uh, sociopathic type of uh, group of people. Um, this was one of the best that I, I thought was really powerful is, is, uh, was the prisoner's dilemma model. If you have a prisoner's dilemma where you have um, two guys that are in the clink and they're both being offered a deal, the this person will have no problem taking the deal and selling out the other person. The empath would be like, oh, I don't want to see my friend go to jail. And so they will, they will take it upon themselves. So in that situation, the empath, the compassionate person will always lose in this kind of scenario. And the narcissist will always win. And that's how you end up with situations where you have the most corrupt people in, in power, you, you know? Um, they're willing to do whatever it takes to, um, to, 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 uh, to win essentially. Or the empath is wanting to, you know, give everything away. Giving our power away was, is uh, the biggest challenge. It's really about becoming complete. Uh, it's really about looking inward and realizing that fixing the world starts on the inside of each and every person. And then collectively working together as well to help each other um, improve um, and to see really as a society we all have to look at ourselves honestly in the society and see that there is a sickness in this society. Um, and we can be as mad about it as we want. And we can say, oh, just put them all on an island somewhere. Let them, you know, eat one another. And they will. They, they eat their own. Um, but the fact is, is that, yeah, we could do that. And we can't be foolish and, oh, you know, I feel so sorry for them. It's like, let's have compassion. It's more about we need to be honest and look at the the truth in this society is that there is this uh, part of our society that is not well um, and it needs and that trauma is going to have to be healed also. And we have to do that by being willing to look at just how bad it's gotten. How did we really get to this point? You know, um, yeah, we could try and coddle society and coddle the masses. We don't want to stress people out. We don't really want to tell them that how bad it really got. We don't want to tell them that there's, you know, bodies of people inside of, you know, underground facilities being used for experimentation. You know, we don't want to tell them these horrible things that have been going on. Uh, so we're just going to just tell them, you know, the, the bare minimum of what we have to tell them so they get the message. Well, that's not enough. It's not okay. Clearing trauma, because really this is one unit, one body. Clearing trauma means that we have to really have to acknowledge okay this is what's going on doesn't mean we have to relive it we don't even necessarily need pictures of it we may not need all the full and total gory details of it um we don't necessarily want to relive it or re or damage the psyche uh, and the quantum psyche uh, of the morphic field further but we at least need to understand what's happened um so that we can release that and heal it and move through it but it is really important that we t we have a clear understanding of what has gone on. Um, even if it's really just a very morbid list of, you know, these are the kinds of things that have been going on. Um, so that we can move through that trauma, we can face it and say, these are the realities of what happens when, you know, um, we do X, Y, Z thing, right? And being honest with yourself, that's part of getting through. That's part of... Um, healing yourself is the first, the, the bravery that it takes to take a look at something and say, perhaps what I'm seeing isn't real. Perhaps what I'm seeing is what I want to see. Perhaps what I'm seeing is actually a reflection of me, or maybe, um, I'm projecting what I want to see, um, onto them. 
Um, but we have to be honest with ourselves, you know, in, at the individual level and at the society level. And, and unfortunately, we can hate these people all day long, but that's the reality is, is that they're, in the end, they are one of the best tools that we have to um, make ourselves whole as, as, as an individual and also as a society. Because we have to say, what went wrong here? How did this even happen? How did these people get to this point? Did we fail them? Were they born like this? Are they a different kind of human? Do we need to acknowledge that there's different kinds of people? Um, you know, do we need to be better educated on what kinds of people there are in the world? You know, what makes them tick? If they're unwell, how do we help them get better? Um, you know, because if you don't, uh, if you want to just look the other way and say, this was a horrible experience, you know, we're lucky we made it through it. Sheesh, whoo, wipe your head. Okay, glad they're in jail now. That's not going to make it not come back. Because I tell you right now, through trauma and through um, working with it, even for myself or for the people that work with me, uh, you can turn your back to it all you want, but it will just keep happening. It will just keep coming back. So either we face it all together um, and be willing to see what it really is, uh, or it will continue to prog get progressively worse and progressively worse until we do. And that's just the cycle of things. Because energetically, um, whatever's happening here is toxic and avoiding it is what allows it to get progressively worse. So that's the, that's the profile. It took three videos with three hours to just explain it. Um, I, hopefully this will help people to not, to not beat themselves up as badly when they do, when this does unfold and they realize that things aren't what they thought it was and. They won't even know the, they'll probably only know the, the slightest bit about it, um, you know, scratching the surface of how deep it all goes. But hopefully, if you're patient enough to sit through these videos and recordings and uh, really learn a little bit about what it is the world's been kind of dealing with here, you will then have a little more compassion for yourself um, as to having been misled or mis mis um, mistaken, because this is extremely complicated web of different tactics, some very very on purpose, um, and also in some very innate. So I can't tell you what causes it. I don't know. Again, it's not really so much about psychological profiles and medicinal, you know, diagnoses. It's really about this is the list of behaviors that's pretty much sums it all up um, that his, is noticeably consistent um, in relationships. Um, it's a growing pattern of behavior. It, it's pretty much scalable from lower level all the way to the top. Uh, it's good enough that I feel like I can put this profile out there and I can stand on it. And uh, people, every person that I've shown this to, one of the nicest compliments I got, in fact, was a person that said to me, hey, you know, all I needed was somebody to tell me that I wasn't crazy and that what I was seeing really was not making sense. Um, and that gave me the strength that I needed to feel like I could... You know, I, I didn't feel crazy anymore, basically. So I hope that that does this for somebody, right? I hope that they can look at this and say, wow, I'm, I'm not losing my mind. Wow, really, this, this is actually happening. Maybe it's not me. You know, maybe, you know, all the people in this group that I hang out with really do have it wrong. Maybe what these people are doing is actually screwed up, you know? And have them not feel alone. Because that isolation thing, boy, I tell you, it really is a, um, it's really powerful when, when people feel like, when they question their own sanity. Um, and you know what the doctor will say, you know, most of the time, if you're, if you feel like you're, if you're questioning your own sanity, or if you're questioning whether you're sane or not, you probably are. You probably are sane. So... The world feels like it's going crazy right now. And people really feel like they're losing their minds. And things don't make any sense. And it's been by design. Um, you have a really, you know, 
as you put it, these people are sick. You're a group of really sick individuals that um, believe 100% what they're doing. It's very hive-minded, um, you know. And really the way out of this is to understand what we're dealing with, to kind of immunize yourself or, you know, build your resistance by understanding what the tactics are so that you're not so easily misled. And to, you know, be willing to move to the ball and just say, you know what, because of how complicated this profile is, it's real easy for me to get this wrong. So I'm going to sit back and observe it and I'm going to try and see what these people are doing, um, not just what they're saying, and look at some of the data. So I hope this will motivate people to, you know, if somebody is saying to you things aren't what they seem, I encourage you to hear what they have to say and ask them for the facts and the data that supports what they're saying to you. Instead of just assuming that what you've been told is true, everybody has to stop and say to themselves, I'm going off of verbal promises and I'm going off of what I've been told. It's all words. It has no actual intrinsic value until it's in action. So I'm going to go and I'm looking and I want to see, you know, I want to see both sides of this and I need to like actually put down all the labels for a minute, put down all my emotional feelings and it probably would mean a lot to this other person if I hear out what they have to say and ask them to show me what they're talking about. And just see it for yourself. You know? This is how we start to heal things. This big wall that's been built between us, and I don't mean the wall on the, you know, south coast. I'm mean, talking... There's divides that have been put in all over the place. And that's the isolation tactic. You know, we have to start with talking to one another again. That's got to start. That's that's where everything starts. And that person saying that to me, that, you know, the most important thing you did was to, to tell me I wasn't nuts, you know, to make it so they didn't feel alone and that they weren't off in, in, a, in a spaceship, you know, just going crazy, you know, because that's the number one thing, the number one thing. They make everybody doubt themselves. So that way you're off kilter and you, you can't get your foundation. Everybody, everybody feels like they have no solid foundation all the time where these people are in the mix. You know, you feel unstable and you feel unsafe all the time. And, you know, it's hard to see why. It's because they want you to think that, that they're your God and that they're the only ones that can help you and they're the only ones that can save you and they're the only ones that can tell you what to think and they're the only ones that can make things that make sense. And yet they never do. So that's the profile, guys. That's that's that on the world scale. Um, it is so completely complicated. I probably didn't get all of it, but I think I did. I definitely touched all the topics that I've had um, jotted down for a long time. Um, but since I'd only addressed them at a relationship level, I wanted to try and put them on the, the world stage for people to see just what a disaster it is um, and what we're up against but I have a lot of faith in people, and uh, I do see things moving. I do see people starting to get that sense that things are not making sense anymore. Um, you know, and the more they try and control things, and the more the, their anxiety kicks in, the more they behave erratically, and the more they make mistakes, and the more they trigger um, people to uh, ask the question of, you know, or, or I could start to see that things don't make sense. Um, and that's why I wanted to make sure that these videos were up and to make sure that people had this data available to them. If they stumble upon it, um, it'll be some of the best information they'll ever get with respects to what the hell's been going on in the world and hopefully make some sense of it. Um, even though it sounds as crazy as possible, you know, uh, all they have to do is take this information and start looking at the world again based on this, based on what they've been told here and apply it. You see, does it hold true? Because I think you're going to find that it, it really does. It, um, it holds up really well. Um, so keep on keeping on, everybody. And I uh, wish you all the best. Hope to see everyone on the other side of this um, in a world that we all want to, you know, that we all be happy to be in, um, in a world where we can all treat each other the way we should. And uh, hoping that maybe in the long run someday we can figure out how to heal whatever this is that's causing such a, such a toxic world. Okay, take care.